KOTV 6, Tulsa. This is the News on 6, the 10 o'clock edition with Clayton Vaughn, Karen Carlson, meteorologist Jim Giles, and Bob Stevens with sports. We was doing some back burn over there and the wind come up and just took it right on. That's, uh, that's how it started. A wall of fire fanned by high wind burns across green country. Good evening, I'm Glenda Sylvie, sitting in for Karen Carlson. And I'm Clayton Vaughn. High winds made it a long evening for firefighters here in northeast Oklahoma today. The biggest fires were in Bartlesville. One man hospitalized with smoke inhalation and three firefighters have been treated for eye irritation because of the heavy smoke. Our coverage tonight begins with Laura Brewster in Bartlesville. The grass fire in northwest Bartlesville was reported around noon, but it spread quickly after that. By late afternoon, the blaze had charred hundreds of acres of grass and trees. And the smoke was so thick, some residents were urged to evacuate. The most refused to leave. Well, no, I had to stay with it. I mean, you can't get scared when you got to do something. Yeah, it was real bad. I just sort of got... They were wearing masks up to the... Kind of in the car, you know, on the other side where it just kind of blow over it and I could just kind of breathe the good air, I guess. That's all I know. Only a few miles from the Trammell home, firefighters spent the evening lighting a backfire, then keeping watch over it. It was set to keep the original fire from moving east into the more heavily populated part of Bartlesville. Despite high winds, firefighters were able to keep it under tight control. Oh, uh, we'll have to just stand by the night and make sure it doesn't burn back into any more unburned areas. But the wind was causing flare-ups down the road. Gusts kept fanning the flames of the original fire. Firefighters had to work fast to keep the flare-ups from jumping across roadways into new areas. The high flames also forced some residents to abandon efforts to save their homes on their own and run to firefighters for backup. Firemen say it may take a couple of days before this fire is completely out. But they have no answer for another question, how the fire began. It may have started as a trash fire, but there are reports a man was seen setting the fire this morning. Laura Brewster, Channel 6 News. Tonight, firefighters continue to keep a close watch on the fire. Terry Hadley now joins us from the scene in Bartlesville. Terry, what's the situation up there tonight? Well, as you can see behind me, Clayton, the fire is still burning. However, fire officials say it's, for the most part, under control. You're looking at pasture land, uh, grazing land, and, and every year they harvest some hay here. Uh, and while it's still burning, it is no threat to buildings. Uh, earlier, however, one barn and a few other sheds did burn uh, badly, burned to the ground in some cases. Uh, but that is pretty much uh, the extent of the damage. They are, they being fire officials, are keeping an eye on the situation, but this is well away from any uh, structures that uh, could be threatened by the fire. As you can see by the direction of the flames, the wind is still pretty heavy, although not as brisk as it was earlier. So things are looking better here. It's going to be a while before this fire burns itself out. However, things look pretty good, and for the most part, any threat to any structures or people is over for now. All right, Terry, thank you for the report and for keeping us posted throughout the evening. About 30 miles to the south, in Skytook throughout the evening, there were similar scenes. Grass fires burning out of control near the intersection of U.S. 75 and State Highway 20. Julie Matsko has that report. Firefighters near Skyatook could barely keep pace with the windswept flames, so open fields were left to burn while fire crews positioned themselves to protect property. All we can do is just wait for it to come to us and uh, build fire guards, but the wind's blowing so strong it's jumping them. The 40 mile an hour wind swept the flames across Highway 75 onto the Cooper Ranch. It suddenly started so fast and, and the wind was blowing so hard that said, my God, what's going to happen to us? Ranch hands brought in tractors to build fire breaks, but the best protection turned out to be the ranch pond. And with the help of firefighters, Cooper Ranch was spared any major damage. At Osage Ford, cars were moved to the far side of the parking lot, beyond the reach of the fiery menace. 
And as the sun set, the fire's eerie glow helped signal crews to trouble spots. In some areas, the fields were so muddy, the trucks couldn't get in. So firefighters just had to sit watch and hope the flames would burn themselves out. Most of what burned near Skyatook was rangeland. In fact, it appears that's where the whole thing began. We was doing some back burn over there, and the wind came up and just took it right on. And that's, uh, that's how it started. We was wanting it all burn off anyway. And this is, it'll help the, help the land. While the grass fire may be beneficial for ranchers, it was a real battle for firefighters. And they're just thankful this one ended with no casualties. Julie Matsko, Channel 6 News. In other news tonight, the state medical examiner says that a heart attack victim killed in a wreck involving an EMSA ambulance yesterday died of natural causes, not injuries from the accident. Her death came after the ambulance was rerouted from St. Francis Hospital to St. John Medical Center. Miles Saunders joins us now with more on the inquiry into how it all happened. Miles? Well, Glenda, the uh, ambulance crew set out to transport the heart attack victim about five yesterday. Their destination at that time was St. Francis Hospital. But a few minutes later, with the ambulance just a little more than a mile from St. Francis, plans suddenly changed. Are you guys going to be able to accept, accept this patient? We're on divert for any critical care ICU patient. Okay, I'll divert. Thanks. Okay. The wreck that came a few minutes later as the ambulance headed for St. John was perhaps bad luck. But the question arises, why was an ambulance carrying a patient in need of emergency care diverted to a hospital five miles away went a little more than a mile from another emergency room. Today, we talked with officials with both EMSA and St. Francis Hospital. No, we didn't turn patient away. We would never do that. We were on diversion status, and that was what was reported to the EMSA dispatch. The problem revolved around a divert status on critical care patients put into effect by St. Francis on Sunday. The hospital's 48-bed intensive care unit was filled to capacity. Still, under Tulsa emergency protocol, paramedics can override divert status if conditions warrant. In the end, it was EMSA's call. 21, we're at 5 on you. Well, you need to divert to St. John. St. Francis is diverted. We've got to divert. From there to St. John, sir. With the patient not responding to first-line treatment by paramedics, EMSA apparently determined time was no longer a critical factor a position backed up by St. Francis Hospital. But the question remains, how common is it for patients in need of urgent care to have their trip to the hospital extended by a divert status? It doesn't happen very often. Now, hospitals go on diversion status um, quite frequently. The numbers of patients that are actually diverted because of the diversion status are not very many. Maybe not, but EMSA says it's happened three other times in the last two weeks. Still, EMSA's Steve Williamson stands by the final decision on yesterday's case. The situation, as far as listening to it, everybody was working for the benefit of the patient. No one was asleep at the switch. Uh, I just wish that we'd had all the beds in the city available. Now, the reason there were no beds available at St. Francis yesterday had nothing to do with space or equipment. The problem across the city and across the nation, for that matter, is a lack of nurses. St. Francis alone would add 16 ICU beds if they could find the nurses to staff those beds. What to do in the meantime, EMSA says it plans to try and monitor divert statuses at all city hospitals, and uh, they hope to look at that more closely in the future and kind of keep track of that so they can uh, react to these things a lot earlier Certainly. than they were able to this time. All right. Thank you, Miles. Clayton? Well, later this year... Tulsans will vote on a bond issue to improve city streets. And now it appears next January we will be voting on a school bond issue as well. Kim Graham reports tonight that the money would be used for much needed repairs. Paint foreman Bob Bergman is on the lookout for any major paint jobs, tile or glass repairs. Burroughs Elementary School is 65 years old and hasn't had any major renovations in years. Officials say classrooms across the district are in desperate need of repair. At Burroughs, the paint is peeling off the walls and both ceiling and floor tiles need replacing. All that could cost nearly $100,000 at this school alone. I think it's critical that we, that we recognize that as we have still more than 40,000 students enrolled in this school system, that we've got many buildings that do need some care and attention. 
Uh, we just do not have the ongoing funds each year in our general operating budget to do the kinds of things that need to be done when you have buildings that have received that much use. The district hasn't asked Tolson's to approve bond money to upgrade facilities since 1969. Officials say declining enrollment and the closing of 30 schools in 12 years are the reasons why. Now school officials have nine months to convince Tolson's the funding is needed. We're going to have to do an extensive education to the public in terms of what it is that we're asking and why we're asking and what it's going to involve as it relates to the people in the community. Maintenance supervisors have until April 10th to determine exactly how much work needs to be done. An estimate will be presented to the school board this summer. Kim Graham, Channel 6 News. An update, Superintendent Zinke could find out tomorrow if he is among the finalists for the superintendent's job in Tampa, Florida. Zinke has also applied for the top school job in Jacksonville, Florida. Sources here and in Florida say Zinke is a top contender in both communities. Still ahead, Oklahoma lawmakers tackle a tough question. Should we have the right to end a life that consists only of pain? Also, assault rifles hit a dead end on the road into this country, and the Discovery astronauts could be back on Earth sooner than expected. Now here's Jim Giles with the Traveler's Weather. Some cooler weather working into North Texas tomorrow. Dallas, a high of 68. San Antonio, 88 degrees. For the southeast, warm 70s and 80s all around. A few showers around Atlanta. And for the northeastern part of the nation, mild temperatures. Look at New York City at 68. For the Great Lakes, the northern plains, some snow flurries, rather cold. Minneapolis, 23 tomorrow. For the northwest, it looks like quite a bit of cloudiness should be observed. 51 degrees in Seattle. Headed to San Francisco tomorrow, expecting 59 degrees, 84 in Phoenix. Green Country forecast, minutes away. It's March, and your Jeep Eagle dealer is blowing away the competition. Get cash back on an Eagle Premier now. Plus, factory-to-dealer incentives that could save you hundreds more. Get cash back or low financing on an all-new Eagle Summit. There's never been a better time to grab savings like these. But hurry, once these deals stop flying, it's all over till next March. See your Tulsa Jeep Eagle dealers, where you can expect the best. You drove me to it, you know. I banked with you loyally for years. Believed you when you told me about all those wonderful new branches. Then one day I stopped by one of those branches unexpectedly. You told me I couldn't deposit there. Told me I'd have to drive downtown. <laughs> I'm not bitter. I just need complete banking services everywhere. Well, I joined Bank Customers Anonymous. Banked at one of state's financial centers, then another and another, and I've been going state ever since. You brought this on yourselves. Banking in a solid state. Yeah. On Magnum. You read Betty's unfinished work. Did she ask my permission to be her hero and lover? Thomas becomes the object of a writer's fantasy. Your lady has wandered too near the truth. But he's got a real life insurance case. Thomas! Thomas, get out of the car! And someone wants to crush it. Russell Smythe died an hour ago. Cause unknown. On Magnum. Tuesday at 10.30 on Channel 6. The house, the lawn, and my thumb are all the same color. Brown. Call True Green, the Southwest's most trusted expert on healthy green lawns. Oklahoma voters today overwhelmingly approve state question 620. That paves the way for shorter legislative sessions. The proposal, which was strongly backed by Governor Bellman, passed by a margin of about 3 to 1. Today's vote will shut down this year's session of the legislature on May 26th, which will be one month earlier than last year. While the vote on 620 was a runaway, the race for an open state house seat in Cree County was close, very close. Democrat Mike Tyler beat his next door neighbor, Republican Lester Henderson, by 12 votes. Last December, Benny Venata of Sepulpa vacated the post, citing personal reasons. The State House today passed a bill that would allow patients who sign living wills to be denied food and water to hasten death. Supporters say the bill would prevent needless suffering. Opponents say it's another step toward legalizing mercy killings. Redship reports. The terminally ill patient. For some, death could be days away. For others, it could be months, even years. In 1985, living wills became legal in Oklahoma. 
A terminally ill patient can now request to be taken off life support, including food and water, but only if they are competent. A bill considered by House members today would extend that living will to those no longer able to speak for themselves. The bill drew immediate fire from Republicans. We've got abortion on the one hand, now we're having euthanasia on the other hand to get rid of these older people, and I think that this bill is just an abomination. But debate from the bill's author was equally as dramatic. You are not feeding a patient food and water, you are feeding tumors. You are feeding people who are terminally, miserably, horribly near death. The vote was close to party lines. The bill passed 64-36. No one was more disappointed than Tolson Tony Lowinger, who lobbied hard against the bill. Hopefully the Senate will see that passive euthanasia should not be the public policy of the state of Oklahoma, and, and hopefully the Senate will defeat this very harmful legislation. Lounger says legalizing living wills four years ago was the first step in the legalization of mercy killing. Now he says Oklahoma is another step closer. Brett Ship, Channel 6 News at the state capitol. Opponents of semi-automatic weapons have won a battle without firing a shot. The Bush administration today banned the importing of such weapons. The, uh, that also includes the AK-47 assault rifle, a kind of gun used in several recent school shootings. The only semi-automatics that will get past the ban are those used strictly for sport. The decision came today after the government learned that so far this year, applications for imported assault rifles tripled the total for the past three years. The shuttle Discovery is finishing its second day in space, but everything is not A-OK. -okay. The five crew members are having to conserve electricity while engineers on the ground study erratic pressure readings from one of the three hydrogen tanks used to generate power. The problem could force the shuttle to return a day early, Friday. NASA says the astronauts are not in danger and are going about business as usual. They're conducting experiments and taking pictures of environmental damage on Earth. Jim Giles joins us now, and boy, this weather came upon us with virtually no warning at all with those high winds that uh, swept right down from Kansas, Jim. Yeah, we were talking about high winds uh, yesterday for today, but we really didn't anticipate that much dust in the air. Western Kansas, you know, mm -hmm. so extremely dry, and just picked up all the winds, blew them into the state here. We still have a lot of blowing dust outdoors. You can taste it going outside. Complete forecast right after this. Record days at Evans means record savings for you because all present stock must go. We've bought more furniture, record amounts, than anyone in Oklahoma has ever bought at one time. It's starting to come in, so... All present stock must go. Example, 50% off a huge selection of kids and young adult furniture. Choose from cherry, white, or oak. This Broyhill loft bed would be perfect for a kid's room. It's $2.29 because... All present stock must go. We sell more furniture than anyone in Tulsa. Come see why at 36 and South Sheridan. Evans. In response to the outdated saying of neither a borrower nor a lender be, Bank of Oklahoma reintroduces an often forgotten word of wisdom. Bunk. That's because we have $5 million of available personal loan money at a very special fixed rate for cars, for boats, for RVs, for home equity loans. And you can take 90 days before making your first payment. Fair-priced, full-service personal loans. Apply today at Bank of Oklahoma. If you're like me, you appreciate not only the quality of products you buy, but also the type of place that you buy them from. <laughs> That's what makes shopping at Drug Mart so much fun. They have a wide selection of over 25,000 different products to choose from, displayed on the shelves. They offer my family the kind of products I've come to expect, and at unbelievably low prices. If you want the best for your family, shop at Drug Mart, located in Summit Square on the upper level, southwest corner, 71st and Sheridan. Front moved through just before noon today. Of course, it didn't cool us down much, but now at this time, we're seeing the temperatures on the way down. Tomorrow's going to be considerably cooler than we experienced today. Still a lot of dust in the air. It's going to be most of the night before it settles out for the most part. It'll be even hazy tomorrow, I am quite sure. On the hour, we're looking at blowing dust. Still reported at the airport. Visibility, 6 miles, 52 degrees. Our temperature, 22% our relative humidity. Winds are out of the north. Still quite breezy, rising barometer. Pollen count, it is very high. Cedar is uh, prominent. 
but not as high as yesterday. 7,775 yesterday, I remind you, it was like 22,000 plus. Let's take a look at our temperature range today. It's a nice day. 76, finally, our afternoon high. Four, 50 degrees, early morning low. There's the normal range. That's the 30-year average range, 37 to 60. Satellite view, the blowing dust isn't quite as obvious as it was at 6 o'clock on this particular view, but you can still see a lot of blowing dust in the southern part of Missouri, then on through the central part of Oklahoma, and it kind of blends with the uh, background colors here. 52 on the hour in Tulsa, 2 degrees cooler in Oklahoma City. Visibility still reported like a mile in Oklahoma City to a half mile and a half to three quarters of a mile, fairly common through central and western Oklahoma. Blowing dust now all the way down to the Red River. Stiff northerly winds, but gradually dying out as this high pressure, the center of the high, moves our way overnight. Here's a look at high temperatures around the region today. 76 degrees in Tulsa, 77 degrees over in Wagner, Muskogee. Uh, Charlie Snyder reported one of the warmest readings at 82. Now, if you were with us during our first news segment, of course, they interviewed Walter Trommel up in Bartlesville. His property was heavily involved in the fires up there. I hope everything is going well for Walter tonight. Was unable to give us a temperature, by the way. 80 degrees over in Okmulgee, same in the Eufaula region. How about tonight? It's going to be much cooler, 37 in the Tulsa region. Muskogee down to 38, 39 degrees expected overnight in McAllister. 34 in Fayetteville. Temperatures for tomorrow afternoon, well, not quite as nice as today, but close to normal. 55 in Bartlesville, 55 likewise in Ponca City. If you're traveling over towards Oklahoma City, expect about 59 for tomorrow's high. Here's our forecast map. This is valid tomorrow afternoon. The cold front that moved through here today and reinforced by cooler air during the evening will be clear off the Texas coast, Louisiana coast by tomorrow. A lot of storminess off to the east. Notice another storm system, a cold front moving into the northern plains. Really don't think it's going to make it in here. Snow with that, a lot of wind. There's our next weather maker moving on to the Pacific coast by tomorrow. That could bring us a pretty good chance of showers or thunderstorms over the weekend. Some could get pretty heavy on Saturday. And you see in the southeast quite a bit of uh, showery activity for tomorrow. Let's take a look at our forecast now for the overnight period. Blowing dust all around, cooler temperatures. I'm afraid with the blowing dust, the northern lights will likely not be observed tonight. We do have that haze up there. But yet conditions are proper for that. 37 degrees are overnight low. By tomorrow morning, still hazy.